I can thank you for uh, your attendance. Um, my biography of Celine and Stephen covers uh, his whole life, of course, uh, up to the present. He's now 90, 90 years old. Uh, he's still in good physical health. Uh, he's lost some of his memory. Um, but uh, uh, tonight I will deal principally <coughs> with his early life um, before he came to Australia. It involves international affairs, as you'll see. Uh, he, he had a very international upbringing, um, and he was certainly influenced by somebody with strong interest in international affairs. Um, St. Indian Stevens International work on behalf of Australia, Britain, the United Nations, the Commonwealth of Nations, and the International War Crimes Tribunal for Yugoslavia at The Hague is practically unknown to the vast majority of Australians. It involved him in the politics of Ulster, Bangladesh, where he mediated between the, uh, the governing party and the opposition party in the run-up to the uh, 1993 elections uh, in an atmosphere fraught with the threat of a coup d'etat. Um, Ulster, he was asked by the British government if he would be a neutral mediator between the Catholic and Protestant parties to try to at least begin the search for a solution there. and, and uh, that led on to the Good Friday Agreements, which uh, ended violence in Ulster. Cambodia, where he led a UN team to establish or to, uh, to work out what the panoply of the War Crimes Tribunal set up would be there. Uh, Burma, where he led two um, international labor organization slash UN teams to investigate whether or not the government was using conscript labor in the um, interior. Uh, and Yugoslavia, of course, uh, where he was one of the judges on the first war crimes tribunal to sit on a case since those cases in Nuremberg and Tokyo uh, after the Second World War. Uh, his international work while governor general is also generally unknown here. Um, he expanded the international aspect of the office diplomatically and politically, standing in for the Prime Minister in closed and sometimes delicate political discussions. Uh, and I show uh, uh, those discussions, uh, private discussions, with reference to his private files and correspondence to which I, I was given un un uncensored access. But utterly unknown to anyone outside of St. Indian's family was his international life prior to the Second World War. His, his 17 years of intellectual formation under the benefactions of a woman of eccentric and extreme views. St. Indian has never been religious, yet his life could be seen as lived under the protection of benevol benevolent deity, whether you call that fortune, the fates, or God. He would call it good luck. Um, Though his origins were, uh, you would say, say his origins were unpromising, the circumstances of his birth and his early life enabled him to achieve what he did. In particular, it was Miss Nina Beatrice Milne, after whom he was given his first name, Ninian after Nina, <laughs> who made the difference between the Ninian Stephen we know and the Ninian Stephen who, without her, would almost certainly have lived his life in obscurity. This is not to say that individual will counts for nothing, but without favorable circumstances, the strongest will is frustrated and discouraged. A person can bend circumstances to their will, but cannot make or unmake circumstance. Stephen's father was insignificant in his life, and I'll come to him in a moment. Stephen never knew it. Stephen's maternal grandfather, James Cruikshank, was a gamekeeper on estates in, in the Scottish Highlands around Inverness. <clears throat> Stephen's mother, Barbara Cruikshank, was a seamstress, then a lady's maid, and then a nurse. The family lived in a mill croft 
14 miles south of Inverness in a town called Tomatin, where there's a big distillery. Um, there were few books in the house. Barbara Crookshank and his mother left home at about 17 to work as a seamstress and then got a job as a lady's maid with a rich family. And it was there uh, with that family uh, that she met one of their chauffeurs, Fred Stephen, son of a gamekeeper, who later became her husband and the father um, of our former Governor General. Around 1912, Barbara Crookshank took a position with a Mrs. Patrick Campbell in Edinburgh and travelled with her in 1913 to the south of France, where she was introduced to Nina Milne, M-Y-L-N-E, an Australian woman who lived on her share of annual wool checks from a Queensland pastoral empire. With one of her sisters, Nina Milne moved around from one continental resort to another, mainly in Germany and the south of France. Very nice life in those halcyon uh, pre-war years. Just three when her father died, Nina Milne had grown up in Sydney, mixing in fashionable circles there and in Brisbane. She had immense will and determination and a thorough knowledge of European history and biography. In 1908, she traveled to Japan, still quite young, traveled to Japan, mixing in the diplomatic circles there, particularly making friends with German uh, diplomats in Tokyo before heading for Europe for a few years of drifting about. And it was in the south of France that Nina Milne asked the woman who had become Nina and Stephen's mother, uh, Barbara Crookshank, to work for her as a lady's maid in London and on the continent. But when the war broke out, Nina Milne's sister was in Germany. And with the help of the German authorities, the sister was enabled to travel to England, which was kindness that Nina Milne never forgot. In 1915, she decided to move to Paris and work for the American Ambulance Hospital, taking Barbara Crookshank with her. The choice to work for an institution run by neutrals suggests Nina's own neutrality. Meanwhile, Barbara Crookshank had kept in touch with Fred Stephen, who was now serving in France in motor transport, and on the 19th September 1918, they were married during the period of leave that he had. They were married up in Scotland. So now there were three of them, Nina Milne, Barbara Crookshank, and Fred Stephen. In 1919 or 1920, Nina Milne bought a poultry farm, uh, Blenheim Cottage, for Fred to work at uh, a town called Nettlebed near Henley-on-Thames, the three of them moved there, though Nina held on to her London flat. It was at Blenheim Cottage that Ninny and Martin Stephen was born on Friday, 15 June 1923. For richer or poorer, better or worse, three weeks later, Fred Stephen boarded the Cunard Line ship Alsonia at Southampton, destination Montreal, never to return. <laughs> Ninian Stephen would later be told that his father had died from the after effects of gas poisoning. This is the story you'd find on the Wikipedia entry on Ninian Stephen, for example, and you find it in a lot of other bio sources. And uh, uh, so Ninian would believe this until 2003 when his older cousin Isabel, <coughs> lunching with the family in Melbourne, being encouraged to speak about Fred Stephen revealed the truth that she'd known all along and had been covered up. Then, researchers by St. Indian's daughters using the internet uncovered Fred Stevens' subsequent bigamous marriage in 1941 in Canada. But back in 1923, <coughs> what circumstances drove him away from his first wife and his three-week-old son? <coughs> well, I can only guess, but no doubt three was a crowd and four was no better. An older woman, employer, provider, dominant personality, always there with the young couple in the house she paid for. 
the two women quote, and I quote Ninian's own words, the two women so close one with the other, how did it last so long? <laughs> That's the question. How did it last three weeks? Um, anyway, on 19 July 1923, Barbara Stephen registered the birth at Henley on Thames, and the child's name is Ninian Martin Stephen. As I say, Ninian after Nina, not the Scottish saint, although there is a Scottish saint Ninian, because Nina Milne detested the Catholic Church and all of its paraphernalia. Sitting around in an Oxfordshire poultry farm with no one left to run it, and the money to be out of there, Miss Milne decided that this child would have a future. She had the means and she certainly had the will. Uh, her preference had always been to live on the continent rather than in uh, the UK, so that, that's where they went. In September, three months old, Ninian was christened at Geneva in one of the chapels in John Calvin's personal church, St. Pierre Cathedral. The following year, they were in Paris. In March and April 1925, they were living, living at the Hotel Cosmopolitan in Cannes. In May, they were at the Hotel Windsor in Monte Carlo. In June, they were in the Auvergne. Occasionally, they would visit England and Scotland. From late 1925 through 1928, they were living in an apartment in the affluent 16th arrondissement in Paris on the right bank. Stephen remembers Rose, their French maid, who was always very good to me and spoiled me with sweet pastries. During March of 1927, Nina Milne, Barbara and Ninian were in Cairns again and for the summer they were at the beach near Saint Malo in Brittany. <coughs> that, that, that was their life. By now Ninian was four and his education began uh, not in England, not in Scotland, but in Germany. In Wiesbaden, a spa town on the Rhine, they took an apartment owned by Frau Geheimat Pfeiffer. Ninian attending a small kindergarten there, which he still remembers. For his schooling, they chose Edinburgh, moving there in 1929. Ninian went to George Watson's College, a prestigious and independent day school for boys. The price of wool at that stage was depressed. So to make ends meet, Ninian's mother managed some private hotels around Edinburgh. She had long since ceased to be paid by Miss Milne. Instead, they shared whatever income uh, either of them received. And there was always enough for holidays, he remembers, for holidays, for toys, and swimming and riding lessons for him. So, um, here in, in summer and during vacation, he'd take the train up to the Highlands, he'd stay with his grandparents. Ninian's grandfather would read the Bible, uh, a work totally unknown to Ninian, <coughs> uh, who was never taken to church by his mother or by Miss Milne. As Miss Milne thought Watson's insufficiently appreciative of his talents, in January 1933, Ninian commenced at the Edinburgh Academy. Uh, it's an independent day school founded in 1824 <coughs> by Henry Coburn, strong on classics. Sir Walter Scott was a founding director and its alumni included Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, in the evenings, Miss Milne would sit with Ninian, listening as he conjugated his Latin verbs, sharing his difficulties with algebra and geometry. Both loved history and literature. After four years at the Edinburgh Academy, Nina decided to move to London with him, leaving his mother Barbara to continue working in Edinburgh. So you can see how close Nina Milne is with Nina and Stephen, um, closer than his mother. The school that Nina chose was St Paul's School, founded in 1509 by John Collett, one of the top schools in Britain and on a par with Eton. John Milton and Samuel Pepys were among hundreds of prominent alumni. It was then in Hammersmith, and Ninian attended from spring 1937 until March 1938. Miss Milne, 
who was herself free thinking, never left Ninin at any of these schools for too long, intending, I suppose, that his mind be a product of all and a prisoner of none. The two lived in hotels in South Kensington and later near the Thames in Richmond, but Ninin was encouraged to get away. Uh, in March of 1937, uh, Miss Milne saw to his application for a British passport, which she still has, had access to all his passports, I could always check dates of arrival and departure. Um, so at, that, at the age of 13, Ninian could now travel uh, outside Britain independently. And, um, and he used this passport. Off by himself on the ferry to Saint Malo, he spent three weeks with a French family in April 1937, just a month after he got the passport. Another six weeks in August and September, 1937, visiting the Paris Exposition, photographing the German. I've got all these photographs uh, that he took. I'm sorry, they're in the book. Photographing the German uh, pavilion, the Soviet pavilion, R R Romanian, the other pavilions, and three more weeks in France at the end of that year. Nina Milne was fascinated by European politics and philosophy. Uh, she was deeply interested in the history of the English ruling class in, in, and also in the ruling class uh, of, uh, of France and uh, Germany. And she was fascinated by the ways, as she saw it, when disturbed, by the ways in which the Roman Catholic Church was using uh, what she would call its family connections in Britain and the continent in an attempt to win back power lost incrementally since the Reformation. I've studied her library, which became part of uh, Sardinian's library. She bought scholarly as well as polemical literature, a wide range from Plato's Republic to Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West, <coughs> from E.H. Parker's Studies in Chinese Religion to Edward Shuray's the Great Initiates, from Hilaire Belloc's The Jews to Theodore Greisinger's The Jesuits, A Complete History of Their Open and Secret Proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> For Nina Milne, the principal cultural enemy was neither capitalism nor communism, neither Jews nor banks all of which she disliked and distrusted, but the totalizing tyranny of the Roman Catholic Church, an institution intent on mediating and controlling everything spiritual between man and God, and pro profoundly <coughs> resentful, as she believed, profoundly resentful of its loss of temporal power. Corresponding with her sister Nell, who lived over in Ireland at this time, uh, they used to correspond about cryptic crosswords they both loved doing and other subjects. Nina frequently diverged onto race and religion. She was skeptical regarding Nell's belief in the continuing European influence of top Jewish families. In one of these letters, perhaps written uh, about, about 1940, she finally lost all restraint. As usual, I get nothing back from you but the Jews. I say Rome, so you say Jews. Those Jew families you yourself point out are being exterminated too. The whole giant lie is Rome. The Virgo, the outward charm and love and talent, the family life, in quotes, the family life. The horribleness is Rome. We're all forced to worship everything that is tawdry and fake, a grotesque lie. Okay, one. You can almost hear her family life. <laughs> what does she know or care about family life? <laughs> Ninian knew nothing about family life um, until he had his own family, that is. Um, devoted to Ninian, kind and sacrificing towards him, she'd challenge him intellectually as they sat drinking tea by the fire of an evening or strolled through the park shopping to buy stopping to buy ice creams and enjoy them while relaxing on a seat 
under the trees. And he tried to see her point of view while sometimes taking a contrary one. She wouldn't be persuaded. She let him put the Republican case on the Spanish Civil War, or the case against the, against, uh, the National Socialists in Germany, while she smiled indulgently and then pointed out precisely why he was wrong. Like the majority of Germans, a nation she so much admired, like the engaging and tragic Miss Jean Brodie in the novel and film of that title, or like Unity and Dinah Medford, Dinah Mosley, Nina enthused over fascism and national socialism. This is at a time when Hitler had many admirers. Robert Menzies toured Germany in the late 1930s, while Lloyd George, while Lloyd George made a pilgrimage to converse with Hitler at the Berghof, not to negotiate, but just for a social chat. Uh, uh, by March 1938, it seemed best to leave London and live on the continent more interesting by far, and safer too, if it was Switzerland. So Nina Milne knew about a college, Chion College, uh, C-H-I-L-L-O-N College at Lyon, up a uh, Serpentine Road above Montreux uh, and Lake Geneva. This was an English language international school for boys, one of perhaps 16 privately owned schools in the vicinity of Montreux at that time. There are very few Belle Epoque had never died around there. <coughs> this is 1938. <coughs> and it was still customary for people of means to have their own rooms and furnishings in the grand hotels on the lakefront. Hotels like the Montreux Palace, if you've seen it, where Nabokov lived in the 1960s on the proceedings of Lolita. It would be hard to think of a better locality than Montreux for a child of 15 to complete schooling, directly <coughs> below the best ski runs, next to the lake in the midst of French culture. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, Ninian uh, ordered, not at Chion College in, itself, where you could board, most, most of the students boarded there, <coughs> But at first he boarded with a French family in Montreux itself, ascending the heights to the college each morning by funicular. When his mother arrived a few months later, she and Miss Milne rented a house in Lyon, and then the Villa Elizabeth in nearby Territet, Territe, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, while Ninian boarded in Lyon with another French family. Gion College occupied a large three-story building set in its, in its own landscape park, still cared for to, today, uh, although the building stands empty just a caretaker there. Many of the boys were English, but there were also Americans, there was a sprinkling of Germans, and a few German-Jewish refugees. <coughs> Ninian found the teaching rather bad, his words, but the point of being part of an expensive school like this was not so much the quality of the teaching, but the extracurricular activities on offer, most of them at extra charge, and these are very expensive schools. Uh, I uh, visited the son of the last headmaster of this college in Montreux. He runs a, another school, a, pr a private international school there. Uh, and the one that he runs, um, um, Nehru's daughter uh, um, became prime minister. Indira Gandhi attended there. These are, and many of Stephen's family don't like me calling it a finishing school, but that is what it was. Uh, and he himself, the quality, what quality of the teaching was quite bad. Uh, that wasn't the, the teaching wasn't really the point. Um, so what they would do, um, Ninian learned to ski there during the winter. Groups of boys would stop lessons from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m. Uh, they'd, they'd have in their pockets, they'd have season tickets on the train up to Rochelle de Nye, uh, 2,042 metres above Montreux. They'd spend the, uh, the hours between 11 and 4 skiing. At other times, they'd ride hazardously on small sledges called luge, supine and face up down the frozen road from Glion down to the lake. Um, and uh, they'd row in, in boats uh, called Yol de Mer, 
some, some somewhat wider than conventional fours on Lake Geneva, competing with other international schools around the lake, which is where Ninian learned to, uh, to row. Um, he had his passport uh, visa by the German consulate in Geneva on the 21st of June, 1938. I'll examine the stamp, it's valid for multiple entries into the Reich for one year. And the same month, he went to stay with the family of one of his college friends, the von Schuberts, at Schopenhauerstrasse 53, Nicholas C. Berlin, a grand neo-baroque house designed by Euthesius in 1920. Euthesius, a very important German architect of the, of the Weimar and pre-Weimar period of the Grand. These von Schuberts uh, were anti-Nazi in politics. One wonders in the absence of a Christian name, I don't know what von Schuberts' Christian name was, and given the architecturally significant house, whether this von Schubert was Karl von Schubert, a German diplomat during the imperial period, and Stresemann's right-hand man during the Weimar period. Nina Milne had become friendly with senior German diplomats during her time in Japan, including Baron Mumm, German minister at Peking in 1905, and Count von Monkelas, first secretary of the German embassy at Tokyo in those pre-World War I days. Von Schubert's two sons were very congenial, and, and uh, Ninian quickly found himself conversing happily in German. Then in July, he travelled south to meet up with his mother and with Nina Milne at the hotel and pension Schotsky in Freiburg in Breisgau, riding from there to his friend Andrew Young in Scotland. <coughs> We're spending our holidays in Germany and doing great walks in the Black Forest, but on Wednesday I'm going for a month's trip through northern Italy, finishing with the Dolomites with Herr Weigel, who has a school here and his English wife. Miss Weigel has a nephew of nine called McAdam, who is at the Academy, uh, at the Scottish Academy. There are a lot of swastikas here, and we see lots of black shirts here too, but so far I have not been arrested. It is very hot here, uh, but the food is very good, and we are not eating the bark and dead rats that the people in England told us the Germans lived on. <laughs> <laughs> The August sojourn in Italy with the Weigels included, besides the Dolomites, stays in Venice, Milan, and the Lakes. By um, <clears throat> the end of August, Ninian was again in Switzerland. But it was not yet the end of the holidays. Early in September, Nina Milne took him back into Germany to Nuremberg for the September 1938 Reichsparteitag Gross Deutschland. 5 to 12 September, they were there for the whole seven days, 5 to 12, eight days, 5 to 12 September. The party rally so named that year in celebration of the very recent Anschluss with Austria. This visit was obviously intended by Nina as a political coup de théâtre, albeit at somebody else's theater. <laughs> um, something to impress and finally convince Ninian what kind of ideology really made an impression. <coughs> uh, not satisfied for them merely to be there, she had bought, or somehow got pictures, the photographs Ninian took with his lighter in there, in the stadium, close up to, the, uh, to Hitler, and, and uh, one of the photos shows Hitler saluting straight at the camera. Now, um, you don't just happened by tickets like that. Uh, she'd secured the best tickets at what would turn out to be the last and grandest of these annual displays before the coming war. For instance, for the Hitler Youth Day, held in the uh, Stadion de Hitler Jugend on Saturday 10 September, they were seated in the undercover grandstand from where the Führer spoke. Nina Milne obviously had connections with somebody in the party. Uh, that's, I would say, you know, I wouldn't guarantee it, but I'd say 90, I'd bet 99% on that. Um, it was uh, 
from Nuremberg that 15 year old Ninian took a, a series of sharp photographs uh, as, I, as I just said uh, on other days they were in other venues all told a quote from, from Ninian a wonderful display of armed might with Hitler making long speeches in great stadia and armoured divisions and Stuka bombers on display he wrote from Nuremberg to his London friend Ian Lewis whom he got to know at St Paul's school and whose father managed the Commonwealth Bank in Old, old Jewry on a postcard dated and Frank, 10 September 1938. Dear Ian, I'm writing this PC from Nuremberg, where we're staying, for the Reich Partei type. This morning we saw 100,000 Hitler Jugend parading before Hitler. We were quite near Hitler, we saw him very well. We stay here until Tuesday and have two or more shows, or, uh, and when we have two or more shows or parades every day. <laughs> Uh, I'm going back to school at Glion on the 17th with Mummy and Miss Milne. I hope you have had a nice holiday abroad and that you like your new home. Give my love to the whole family. Much love from Ninian. <coughs> Yet for all its impressiveness, Nina Milne's gesture fell short of purpose. The sort of education she had provided for Ninian was the least likely to produce anyone attracted to regimentation and propaganda. Her fascination with all this was part idealism, part eccentricity. Sincere, but transient like everything passionate. I never knew uh, Nina Milne. Uh, she died in 1946, and I don't judge her. Ninian's personality was different from hers, and he had acquired an interest in the complexities of history. Um, complexities of history incompatible with political intensity. And within three years, he would voluntarily enlist in an army fighting to defend Australia against the disastrous consequences of extreme ideologies. Following the outbreak of war in September 1939, there seems to have been no intention on Nina Milne's part to leave neutral Switzerland in any hurry at all. Um, but by the end of the year, most of the college's students were returning to the United Kingdom or the United States and she was clearly concerned that the phony war, so-called, might turn into something more troubling, possibly even involving Switzerland. By then, they had been joined by Nina's sister, Nell. Accordingly, in December, Nina decided that a return to Australia was prudent. Uh, unforgotten by Stephen over 70 years later is, quote, the suggestion of Australia, Miss Milne's home, and my excitement at the thought of it. Travel agencies were visited, telephone calls made, bookings secured out of Genoa in still neutral Italy <clears throat> on the Italian steamship Rima, destination Melbourne. On 21 December 1939, they crossed into Italy by train through Domodossola, Ninian's passport stamped Entrata there and Washita nine days later in Genoa at the Scala Maritimo. There were around 300 passengers on the ship, he recalls, many of them Hungarian Jews getting out of Europe while they could. The Italian officers and crew were a delightful crowd, unconcerned that there was a war on. A photograph shows Ninian in sports coat and open neck shirt, sitting on the deck with three other passengers, and a ha handsome, I've got this photograph in there too, and a handsome <laughs> Italian officer in immaculate black uniform. The sun is shining, no cloud in the sky, at night, the social life continued. This is sailing through the Mediterranean in wartime. At night, the social life continued. Whereas British ships, in proper accordance with the book, sailed seriously through the Mediterranean in convoy and with lights extinguished at night, quote, we sailed on our own with all lights blazing. This admirably careless spirit continued throughout the voyage, infecting the passengers. When they reached Port Said on 7 January 1940, Ninian accepted an offer from a group of young Australians to disembark, hire a car, see the pyramids, and drive down the desert road to Suez to rejoin the ship there. These were the first Australians he had ever met, and he was struck not just by their relaxed amiability, but their vocabulary and turns of phrase. Halfway along the desert road, 
they stopped and asked him, do you want a lick? <laughs> the only, only thing he had heard of by that name was a pension award for the Welsh Group as their national anthem. <laughs> From Suez they sailed on to Colombo, uh, then Fremantle, where Ninian had his first Australian meal, which was cantaloupe and ice cream. Uh, to me, he said, he told me, to me, it was the first tangible encounter with a new land of milk and honey. And a few days later, they dock in Melbourne. On his next voyage to Australia, or perhaps the one after, following Italy's entry into the war, the Remo would be forcibly taken over by the Australian government at Fremantle as a port of prize. Uh, its charming officers interned at Fremantle Prison, and its crew sent to Rottnest Island for the interim. It would be five years before these unfortunate non-combatants saw their homeland again. Meanwhile, an Indian Stephen found himself in a city where he knew no one. Though he'd had a taste of the culture along the road to Suez, and instinctively liked it. Now, I thought this early history would be of interest to your group. <coughs> Suninian's work in the international sphere was more important uh, than, in my view, more important than his six year tenure as Governor General, and I devote a third of the book to that international work. But his interest in in uh, international affairs began when he was very young. Uh, as the protege of a woman who provided his education and the comforts of his life, a woman of independent views who encouraged and guided him, and from whose political influence he thought his way free, though he continued to love and respect her. Thank you.